Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play Planescape Torment with me, Bring It Dawn. Let's see if we can enter the siege tower and um, see what the big deal is. You approach the location of the portal that the boy Laszlo spoke of. You begin to replay your conversation with him in your head. Maybe the secret to getting in is not to want to get in, you hear yourself say. Let's press any desire to enter the tower. And voila. In we go. I mean, look at these flame effects. I'm gone. Well, let's do a quick save. All right, there it is. You see an iron creature. Its size is staggering. If it stood full height, it would shatter the roof of the siege tower. Thundering echoes rattle the walkways. The creature hammers away on its forge, and the smell of soot and ash fills the air. Updated my journal. Our greetings. Uh, there is a screaming of metal on metal as a giant turns to face you. You suddenly realize the gold is built into the siege tower itself. Girders, pipes, and huge bracers run through its lower torso and into the walls, and the bottom portion of its body makes up the forge itself. What are you? I am iron given purpose. Uh, what purpose? I forge the implements by which the multiverse will be unmade. That sounds like fun. You mean forging weapons? That's your purpose? <laughs> Metal is like flesh. Both carry potential in their veins. When tempered with heat and pressure, the potential surfaces. My purpose is to bring forth this potential, allow it expression. Who do you make these weapons for? I forge them for the sake of entropy. They are pain-seeking expression. What does entropy need weapons for? Beyond this tower, order rallies its legions. The multiverse heals its wounds. In time, its strength may equal entropy. The multiverse is your enemy? Why? Updated my journal. The, multi the multiverse breathes. It grows. It stagnates. It forges its chains around the planes link by link. In time, even entropy may be chained. And you're opposed to chaining entropy. When a thing seals itself against its own destruction, it merely dies a different death. So you're saying immortality is just a different kind of death. Immortality is only a word. All that exists can die. You're saying you could forge a weapon to kill an immortal. Every living thing has weapon, has a weapon against which it has no defense. Time, disease, iron, guilt. How do you know what weapon to use? One must know the enemy to forge such a weapon. And how do I do that? Start with a fragment of the enemy. A drop of blood. A crystallized thought. One of its hopes. All of these things tell the way it can die. What if your enemy strikes from a distance, from shadows, and never shows himself? And that is the fragment of the enemy you must use. How? The actions of your enemy have told you much. The enemy does not wish to engage you directly. That is a weakness. Or for some reason, it cannot engage me directly. That has an equal possibility. Either possibility reveals weakness. How do I exploit that? Okay. How do I exploit that? So we read that. Updated my journal. If the enemy does not wish to confront you directly, deny its wish. Take the battle to the enemy. Updated my journal. Okay. And if the reason it can't attack me directly is because it has no choice. If it is not allowed to confront you directly, find the reason. The reason will reveal a weakness. He said immortality was just a word, that all lives can die. Can you make a weapon that could kill me? Yes. Really? How? I would need a drop of your blood. That is all. Very well. Uh, the tool of your destruction has been re has been forged and educated. It is not enough. Uh, what do you mean? Updated my journal. The magics that keep your heart beating and mend your flesh are strong. You must sink the blade into your body only within a shell where you were cut off from the plains. Why? The reason is not known to me, yet both the weapon and the place are necessary for your destruction. Where would I find such a shell that separated me from the plains? That is not known to me. Well, I just forged my own destruction, if anybody was curious what was going on. Uh, what are you? Alright, we've already done that. Uh, what is this place? This tower is a siege engine. It exists to breach the walls between planes. Breach planes? 
How? Updated my journal. The tower anchors itself upon a plane. A wound is torn in the multiverse when the bridge of the tower opens. Legions may pass from one plane to the other through the tower. When the plane has served Entropy's purpose, the tower anchors itself again. What happened to the legions that have used the tower? Entropy has unmade them. What happened to the planes that each tower invaded? Entropy has unmade them. Alright. Uh, what are you doing? Alright, we already talked about that. Why do you make weapons? Uh, the iron of my body once existed only as minor expressions of pain. Blades, spears, axes, arrowheads, rivets and catapults. From these implements of war was I wrought. And what happened? These minor expressions of pain were melted to force his body. My potential was allowed to surface. Now my purpose is to bring out the potential in other metals. You said that someone melted those weapons and forged your body. Who? Entropy raised me from the planar battlefields. And you said your purpose is to now, now is to forge weapons. Can you do anything with my weapons? Uh, show me what you have brought. I'll study its potential and see if its pain can be given expression. Oh, okay, he's a merchant. Blade of the Immortal. Oh, is this what he gave me? Hmm. Interesting. Alright. Rune Blade. Not very strong, but it gives you 50% resistance to magic. That's pretty good. They seem pretty good too. Um, these also seem pretty good. I'll have enough for any of those though. Is there anything I can sell? He's willing to buy? Probably not. Yeah. Hmm. Alright, well, he's a merchant. Good to know. Now, the gigantic iron golem is still working at its forge. Sparks, ash, and hissing clouds of steam rise up from beneath the walkway. Some questions. Um, have you heard of a night hag named Ravel? The night hag sought to center this city. Her greatest works were those of unmaking. She walked the path of entropy. Do you know what happened to her? Updated my journal. Order set chains about her. She was cast within a cage. Do you know where this cage is? Her prison is unknown to me. All right. Well, I guess that's it. He is, uh... Done. It's funny, because there's a theory about the universe, um... That we live in an entropic universe. I don't remember all the details. All right. I will look it up after this, though, because I remember reading about it, and it was interesting. I don't remember exactly what I read, because it's been a while. Um, let's see. We can, um... So what is this? Is so I probably shouldn't use it since it can kill me. This is a strange blade that the iron golem forged using a drop of your blood. It's an ugly looking weapon, shaped so it resembles one of the symbols on your left arm. Black veins worm their way across the surface of the metal, and the edge looks so dull that it couldn't even cut warm butter. It pulses slightly as you hold it, like a heart. The golem claimed, that, claimed this blade could slay even you, provided it was used in a place that was cut off from the rest of the planes. Fascinating. All right, let's talk to uh, let's talk to Lenny first, because Corvus, the Harmonium Guard, mentioned something about him trusting Lenny. A few questions. Okay, so we've already uh, read all this before. I'll go through it again, though. Um, you see Lenny, he gives you a mock smile at your approach. Well, hello again, Burke. To what do I owe this pleasure? I have some questions. He laughs at you. I ain't no tout. If you've got questions, go find one. 
His smile broadens. Uh, you better push off before I have to bleed you. Which is funny because he was always, uh... Corvus said that he's never been uh, charged with murder or suspected of any sort of murder. Uh, what if I told you Byron Pickett sent me? He stops smiling and examines you for a while. His eyes linger on your scars and he swallows slightly. After a moment, a frown settles on his face and he appears to be nervous. Pickett? Sent you? Why? He said you could answer some questions. He frowns. Uh, what questions? You notice he looks rather tense. Uh, I want to ask you about the papers you stole from Trist. He swallows hard and stares at you. You notice his muscles tense and it looks like he's ready to run. He puts one hand on his hip in a nonchalant manner, but you can tell he is wound tight as a spring. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, Burke. You'd best be off. Smile wickedly. You know what I'm talking about, Lenny. Byron had you steal some papers from Trist. I'm here to collect them. He swallows hard and the corner of one eye starts to twitch. He glances at the scars that cover your body and tries to meet your gaze, but cannot. Collect them. I... I destroyed the papers after I nicked them, just like Byron told me to. He finally meets your gaze. Really? Then why are you so nervous, Lenny? Let me guess. Byron thinks you destroyed the papers, but maybe you didn't. Maybe you kept them. A little blackmail material, perhaps? He stares at you for just a moment, then suddenly turns to run. Grab him before he gets away. Just as he starts to run, you leap forward to grab him. He definitely steps out of your reach and begins to sidestep you. Uh, seeing your quarry about to escape you, escape you... Oh my goodness. Seeing your quarry about to escape you, make another, more desperate lunge at him. I think there should be a comma here. Uh, you fail to grab him, but you manage to bump into him hard, knocking him off balance. Your efforts to foil his escape. Alright, I didn't destroy them. I'll give them to you. Just let me go. Why did you keep them, Lenny? Blackmail, I assume? He snorts and gives you a defiant look. Uh, I kept them so I could turn stag on your boss, Pickett, and keep Trist off the block. He shakes his head. Blackmail my arse. Turn stag? Yes, turn stag. He looks at you for a moment until he realizes you don't know what he means. It means I was going to turn him in, betray him to the harmonium. Uh, by the way, Pickett is not my boss. He stares at you in disbelief. You serious? I thought, but you said... He watches you closely for a moment and then laughs. You gave me the peel, so I'd spill the chant to you. He shakes his head and looks at you with respect. Good job, Cutter. Let's go get the papers, Lenny. He shakes his head sadly. We can't. They're in the warehouse and they're not open for business right now. Rumor has it there's some sort of management change going on, but I don't know if that's true. In any case, I can't get the papers. He looks at you sheepishly. That's why I haven't helped Trist myself, Cutter. I can't get the sodding papers. Alright, I'll look into I'll look into this and get the papers myself then. He smiles at you. Go to the warehouse and tell the clerk, I'm here for a loan, and he'll give you Trist's papers. Uh, if you tell him I gave Pickett the laugh, he'll give you a bonus. What bonus? He laughs. Evidence cutter. It'll take Pickett off the streets for a long, long time if you give it to the right person. He thinks for a moment. If there's someone in the Harmonium you think you can trust, give it to them. Alright, farewell. Updated my journal. Done. So I'll be giving it to Corvus, I suppose. Let's go talk to Byron real quick. I should have probably spoke to Byron first. You see Byron Pickett, the moneylender. Back again? Uh, I want to talk to you about Trist. Ah, Trist. He frowns and looks away. After a moment, he looks at you and raises his eyebrows. What about her? I'm trying to find a missing document for her. He sighs and shakes his head. There is no missing document. That was a ruse instigated by Trist to cast doubt on her debt. This matter has been thoroughly investigated by the Mercy Killers, and they found no evidence of any such documents. The Mercy Killers? Yes, a faction of fanatics dedicated to uncovering the truth in criminal cases and handing out justice. They're often used as investigators by courts of sigil. They're quite thorough, and they found nothing. He glares at you. They could have missed something. That is a possibility, but not very likely. You obviously are not familiar with the Mercy Killers or their methods for you, for you to make such a statement. If they could not find the document, then it does not exist. He looks at you angrily. Someone could have stolen the document and then destroyed it. That way the loan would be paid twice. Updated my journal. For a moment he looks as if he's about to be furious with you. Then a gloating smile crosses his face. What a terrible thought. Pity there is no proof of such an activity. He continues to smile at you. 
Yes, a pity. So tell me, why have Triss sold into slavery? Couldn't she pay you with money in the form of a loan? Yes, she could, and I did make that offer to her. He looks at you sternly. However, she turned me down. I don't allow second chances. No one turns me down without suffering the consequences. No one. Uh, I have some other questions. No, I've had enough of you to last a lifetime. I'll answer no more of your questions. Now pike it, Sod. He turns away from you. Alright, so if I get into the warehouse... I'm gone. My lungs feel like a chimney. I think it's up here, right? Yeah, the warehouse. It's a good name for a warehouse. Come on, we got a special on slave. Use them for whatever you will. They're right over here. Step Vault right of the up. Ninth World. I'm gone. Okay. Can I get back here to talk to these people? Interesting. So I can't get back there. Who are those people? Uh, let's talk to the vault. Oh, I can't get back here. Oh, let's talk to Otis. You see a hulking man, dull-faced and slack-jawed. His muscles, however, are truly a sight to behold. He regards you steadily with dead eyes. Whoa? <laughs> Who are you? Not talk, not talk me. Talk Lena. He waves his oak-like arm at the woman supervisor. Just a few questions? No talk me. He seems agitated. Alright, alright. You see a thin, skulking man. His long, nimble fingers quiver slightly, and he has trouble meeting your eyes when he talks to you. You startled me. I haven't seen you around here before, stranger. What... what do you want from me? Uh, who are you? I'm Connell. I work here. And what is this place? Uh, he looks at you carefully, to see if you're joking. It's the vault of the Ninth World. It's a storehouse. Didn't you read the sign when you came in? Uh, not that carefully. Who are you? Alright, just going back and forth. Alright, you see a middle-aged woman, her face Caroline and compassionate. She looks like she's led a hard life. Can I help you with something, stranger? But who are you? I'm Lena. I supervise these other two. She waves a hand at her companions. Uh, what is it you do here? This is a storehouse. I'm the supervisor. Things get stored here. Things get taken out of here. She shrugs. Not much to tell, really. All right, I guess I gotta talk to. I'm gone. The vault himself. Uh, vault of the Ninth World. Welcome to the vaults of the Ninth World. How may I serve you on this fine day, Sigillian? <laughs> uh, what is this place? The vaults of the Ninth World is pleased to serve as a warehouse for the lower ward and all the sentiments of si si sentience of Sigil. Our motto is: When one world just isn't big enough, we provide storage space for those that have a little, have little to spare. Our prices are competitive, our service exemplary, and our courtesy to customers is known throughout the plains. What are you? I am the voice of the Vault of the Ninth World. I'm here to serve you, the customer. Instruct me in what you desire. I'd like to... Why is this place called the Vault of the Ninth World? Frankly, I have no idea. I think the owners thought that it would be a clever name or something. Is this place really as big as a world? No, it's just a marketing exaggeration. There's a lot of space here, but not that much. Can I store something? I'm sorry, you seem to be full up at the moment. Can I do anything else for you? Or we seem to be full up at the moment. I thought this was supposed to be a huge storehouse. Well, yes. That sounds a little embarrassed. Only we ran out of space and there's something a little fishy going on around here, and I don't know what. The gist of the matter is this. We don't really accept items for storage anymore. Oh, then I have a few questions. Alright, I'd like to claim something. And what was it you're looking for exactly? I was told to tell you that I gave Pickett the, la the laugh. I certainly hope so, sir. Whatever that means. I'm just a big dumb rockhead. <laughs> what? Here are your papers, sir. And here. Thank you. What can I do for you? Alright, never mind, thanks. Farewell. We at the bottom of the Ninth World value your business. Please return. Yeah, I'll bet. I'm gone. Okay. See if I talk to Lena again. Nope. Oh, okay. Hmm. 
So did, wait, did I get the uh, document? Yeah, scroll up to evidence. I'm gone. I'm gonna go talk to Lenny first, and then I'll go talk to Corvus. But I want to see if Lenny has anything else to say about it. Oh, you see Corvus the Harmonium Guard. He smiles at your approach and gives you a slight bow. Hello, friend. I hope you're doing well. Uh, how are you and Karina doing? He smiles proudly. We're doing well, thank you. I owe you for your kindness, friend. I have some questions. Uh, do you know someone named Byron Pickett? Uh, he frowns and nods his head. Yes, I'm familiar with Byron. I have evidence that proves he is involved in a criminal act here in Sigil. He looks at you with interest. Oh, may I see this evidence? I give him the papers. I should have read them first. Eh, let's look. Let's take a look at him. There's a scroll listing the criminal activities of Byron Pickett. Oh, right. Never mind. Questions. Byron Pickett. Yeah, here we go. I give him the papers. Updated my journal. He examines the papers thoroughly, then folds them and puts them away. He nods to you and smiles. Excellent work, citizen. These documents are quite detailed in their content. I personally will see to it that Byron Pickett is taken before the courts. He salutes you and then turns to leave. I shall return shortly. All right. He soon returns and smiles at you. The deed is done. Pickett has been removed from the streets. The evidence has been presented to the courts and soon he will stand trial. He gives you a slight bow. Once again, I thank you. Thank you. I must be going now. Farewell. All right, let's go talk to Trist because she should be I'm gone. free to skedaddle, right? You see Trist, she smiles at your approach and looks hopeful. Have you found the document cutter? Can you free me? Yes, I'll give it to Duran and he will free you. A look of relief washes over her face. You think she's about to faint, but she quickly recovers. I thank you, Cutter. Please return to me after you speak with Duran. Duran! I see, you see Duran the auctioneer. He smiles at your approach. Well met again. Uh, what can I do for you on this glorious smog-ridden day? I wanted to ask you about Trist. He frowns for a moment, then shrugs. Very well, sir. What about Trist? I have proof that she is innocent of any crime. He smiles broadly, then laughs. Very well. Show me this evidence. He holds out his hand. He holds his hand out to you. Give him the document. Uh, he opens the document and quickly scans its contents. After a moment, he sighs, then folds the document and puts it inside his shirt. Seems the courts owe Lady Trist an apology, sir. From this moment, she is free, and I will make all the arrangements to have her status and property returned to her. Thank you, Duran. Updated my journal. No, thank you. It's a rare individual who will, do what you, who will do what you have done. He bows to you. Excuse me. I must speak with Lady Trist. Farewell. He begins walking towards Trist. Farewell. Done. Oh. Trist smiles at you warmly. You're my savior, Cutter. I will forever be in your debt. Uh, I was happy to help... I was happy to help you, Trist. Thank you, Cutter. She glances about and then pauses to think for a moment. You saved me from certain death, Cutter. A slow, painful death. She frowns as she thinks. Please wait here. I shall return shortly. She turns and walks away. All right, Trist. You see Trist approaching. She smiles and waves at you. Hello again, Cutter. Thank you for waiting. Man, I didn't have a choice. Uh, she looks about for a moment, then removes a purse from the folds of her dress. With the document you have provided, the courts will restore my status and finances. This is not much, but it is a well-deserved reward for what you have done. She hands you a purse. Well, thank you, Trist. She smiles. No, I thank you. Farewell, Cutter. Farewell. In knowing the teachings of Zerthamon, I have become stronger. Three whole hit points. Look at him grow. So the spell memorization has gone up. All right. Actually, it could be. In enduring, grow strong. All right. All right. 
And now, I think I'm going to go down to the coffin maker. See what's going on there. And then, uh... Oh, wait, no, I have a quest for the print shop. Let's go there first. So it's just to turn in, um... Yeah. A hand built a scofflaw pen. I'm going to assume there's a lot of people to talk in the, uh... The foundry, so I'm gonna save that probably like a whole episode talking to people in the foundry. So I'm gonna put that off for now. We got a message for you, uh, I've got a message for you to run here or something. Get back in your receipt. Alright, let's talk to him. Scofflaw here. You see a thin, stooped man hunched over a desk, scribbling on a piece of paper. His hair is thinning and drab, drawn back in, into a ponytail, and thin spectacles adorn his hooked nose. His age could be anywhere from his early 20s to his eight, to his late 40s. He doesn't look up as he speaks to you. What do you want? Make it quick. Uh, who are you? My name is Penn Burke, and your question answers mine. You had no idea this was a printing shop before strolling in, and now you've decided to make it your personal quest to waste not only your time, but mine as well. <laughs> okay, what do you print? Books, pamphlets, handbills, words, letters, whatever. He amends. I do not do racy prints, and I won't fulfill any perversions you might want, nor do I care to ask. Okay. Uh, I had some questions. Do they have to do with work? Well, no. Then you're wasting your time and mine. Good day. He turns down to his desk. Don't you ignore me. He waves his hand, and you find yourself outside his shop. What the? Alright, I'm sorry. Alright, I got something for you. Oh dear, have you come to threaten me again? You seem supremely unconcerned. How did you teleport me? Trade secret. Did you actually want something? Or were you coming in to bluster some more? I had a few questions. Yes. Right, do they have to do with work? Yes, Guildspur asked me to deliver a handbill to you so you can print up a hundred copies. He takes the handbill from you, looks it over and says, I'll have it for him later. Go tell him. He turns back to his desk. I hear your words. Alright. I didn't realize I was actually threatening him. I'm curious, is my, uh... I'm still awful good. All right. Uh, Guilt Spur is down here. We'll go talk to him. Finish up that quest. Uh, once again, once again, you've come... You've come to, to me once again. There must be something I can do for you that my brother... Daran cannot, eh? Uh, that handbill is printed. It's printed? Terrific. I knew you were the man for the job. Here, take this message to Keldor Durian at the Foundry. I'm sure he'll be glad to receive it. And you'll be glad of the hundred coins you get in return. Uh, thanks, I guess. Farewell. Updated my journal. Alright, um, I guess to the coffin maker. Hammers, Dimitri, and All right. us. Let's quick save. Make sure he doesn't get mad at us for stealing his stuff. Some people are not a fan of you just coming in and... You're the best man a friend could ever have, Dimitri. Or dim tree. Yeah, I thought it was Dimitri. It's not clear if this is a tombstone or a headboard. <laughs> this board contains various tools used in the art of coffin making. This has to be one of the finest coffins I've ever put together. Ed, Ed dim tree. All right, let's talk to dim tree. You see a tall, slender man with glassy, with a glassy-eyed expression. He seems engrossed in some tale that the shopkeeper is relating. Occasionally he nods his head, but makes no comments of his own. Greetings. Uh, the man turns slightly at your greeting, just enough to acknowledge your presence. You notice that he is a little pale of complexion, and rather gaunt looking. He is giving you a blank stare. The shopkeeper does not seem to notice any of this, and continues with his stream of useless prattle. You sure are a quiet one today, Dimtree. Are you alright? The man continues to stare at you and slowly nods. You wait for any further response, but he says nothing, only stares. You're about to turn away in frustration when you think you notice a strange musty odor about the man. Step closer and sniff. 
You lean in and sniff at the man, unsure of what you'll find. As you do, a musty odor fills your senses. An odor you recognize from your time in the mortuary. It's the smell of dead flesh preserved by magic. You're a zombie, aren't you? Uh, the creature continues to stare at you blankly. Slowly, as if with great effort, he begins to reply to you. Only your speak with dead power makes him understandable. Yes, I am Dimtree. Why are you here, Dimtree? Dimtree slowly glances at the shopkeeper and makes a feeble gesture toward him. Seeing this is a sign of interest, the shopkeeper redoubles his efforts in telling whatever tale he is relating to the poor creature. A Dimtree looks at you again. Hammerus, he talks. Hammerus never stops. Wanders town, annoys Master, annoys everyone. Master create Dimtree, tells Dimtree talk Hammerus. Now Hammerus stay in shop, Master happy. Town happy. Dimtree sad. Is there anything I can do to help you, Dimtree? The creature pauses, then resumes his slow speech with you. You can almost detect a pleading tone in his voice. Yes, fine master, Sebastian. Ask him release me, please. He turns his attention to Hammerus momentarily. Please. Why don't I just put you out of your misery? Dimtree barely shakes his head at you. No, Master Revive. Must ask Master. Sebastian, please. He waits your, he waits your answer. <laughs> Not my job, you know? Uh, sure, Dimtree. I'll see what I can do for you. Updated my journal. You can almost sense a feeling of relief emanating from the zombie. Dimtree, thank you, friend. You're, wel you're welcome. I have some questions. The creature gives you a barely perceptible shrug out of the shoulders. No, nothing. Dimtree summoned by master. No darkness, peace, rest, then hammerous. Sorry, help you if could. Uh, do you know where I can find Sebastian? The creature pauses. Not no. Remember voice. Give order be here. Walking, hammerous, nothing more. Sorry. Alright, let's talk to hammerous real quick, and then we'll call it an episode. One moment, though. You see a rugged-looking, square-jawed man. He turns to you with a wide smile. How are you, Cutter? Good day to you. Good day indeed. He squints at you for a second, then juts his hand out to shake yours. Uh, shake his hand. Greetings. Hammers at your service, member of the Harmonium, and the fashioner of the fine coffins for the recently departed. I think I know you, do I not? Let me see if I can place it. Uh, he pauses to think a moment. Sharper the names I was in the Harmonium. Uh, let me tell you. Everyone... Knew everyone on the entire ward. I have some questions. He nods at you. Ask away. He gives you a broad smile. Uh, who's your friend here? He glances at the customer. Dimtree? He shrugs, like he hadn't considered the fellow before. Quiet. Doesn't say much. Do you, Dimtree? Dimtree doesn't respond, but simply gives the same blank expression. A few seconds later, he nods. Hammer shrugs, turns back to you. Wandered in one day a few weeks back, been irregular ever since. He hasn't bought anything, but he hasn't. Co but he doesn't cause any trouble, so I let him stay. That uh, seems harmless enough. You see, when I was serving in the Harmonium, part of our work was to take people under our wing, give them a little shelter from the chaos of the streets, get them spruced up. You do know that he's a zombie, don't you? He frowns, glances at Dimtree, then back at you. Uh, what nonsense are you rattling on about? Dimtree's no zombie. Sure, he may be quiet and doesn't move much. But it's just because he's a good listener. Punch Dimtree. Look, Dimtree is a zombie. Hammers looks at you in shock. Uh, what in the Harmonium's name are you? Are you? you cuff Dimtree on the skull. Hard. He doesn't even blink. Hammers turns red and starts bellowing. You've gone too far. I won't have you striking my customers. I'm placing you under arrest by the authority of the Harmonium. He stops and stares in wonder as Dimtree still fails to react. He's a zombie, Hammerus. Hammerus stares at Dimtree in confusion. I wonder how he died. You get the feeling that Hammerus just isn't getting it. Just the other day, he seemed quite lively. He harumps for once at a loss for words. Well, it looks like old Dimtree will need a coffin. Good thing he ended up here. Thing is, what kind of coffin should... He looks like he's going to begin a lecture. Uh, I have some questions. Uh, what can you tell me about this ward? Yes, the lower ward. He leans forward as if explaining something to a small child. Small child. Uh, you know, it's a little known to most newcomers and even people in the ward. 
Most people think that this ward gets its name simply because it's not as prestigious as some of the other wards. But that's not it at all. Not at all. Do you know where the name comes from? Hmm? He looks at you expectantly. Uh, from all the lower plane portals? He nods, though he seems a little disappointed that you know. Yes, indeed. These portals to the lower planes are actually the reason for the smog in the skies here. He glances upward, as if imagining a sky above your heads. But I'm sure you're already aware of the conditions that plague this ward. Yeah, ask some other questions. Alright, uh, what can you tell me about the city of Sigil? Sigil. He lets out a long breath. Sigil is the city at the center of all things, or so many believe. It is the city of doors. There are literally thousands of portals here. It is home to the Lady of Pain herself. He shrugs. Sigil is a topic that can fill volumes, and volumes of volumes. Uh, tell me about the Lady of Pain. The Lady of Pain. Hammers leans in and drops his voice slightly. One of the multiverse's greatest mysteries, everyone will agree. I think she's proved beyond doubt, without shadow, that females are the most dangerous creatures in the multiverse. He sighs. Uh, go on. Some say she's a goddess, a power that's made Sigil her home. Truth is, she breaks the laws of every power I've encountered. Powers need worshippers, gives them their power. But the lady doesn't like to be worshipped. People who do end up in her shadow, their flesh torn apart by invisible blades. Now I've seen some horrible things in my life, things that would make another man's knees go weak and make him lose control of his vitals. It doesn't even compare to seeing one of the lady's victims. Interesting, what else can you tell me? Next is, she won't take to people who try to play God in Sigil. So you may not know this, but first off, no powers can enter Sigil. Not Zeus, not Ra, no one. Word is that the latest presence somehow keeps them out. Can't get in, not a one. And that twists their sims like you wouldn't believe. Sigil is just a sweet fruit that anyone would want to pluck. That the other powers are always looking for some way into Sigil. They haven't succeeded. Go on. Well, it goes beyond that. Not only does the lady help... Not only does the lady keep them out, she keeps anybody inside the city from harming it. Certainly she has help from her faction, the Harmonium, since we like order. But every once in a while, a foolish blaster takes it in their head to start uh, fighting on the streets of the city. Maybe decide to kill a few Davis, brew up some chaos, or start casting mass destruction spells. Not a good thing. Makes the lady upset. Doesn't like to see her city hurt. She'll kill you, or maze you, for doing such. Maze you? You haven't heard of the mazes? He looks at you condescendingly. You are green. The lady's got extra-dimensional prisons she can place special offenders in. You see, she takes little bits of sigil, shapes them into mazes, and then cuts them off from sigil. You'll be walking home one night, or be stepping through an archway near your home, then suddenly everything changes. You won't be in the place you remember. You'll be trapped. Chan is that there is one way to get out of each maze, but you'll be dead and gone before you tumble onto the dark of how to escape. Sorry if I'm reading this quickly, it's a lot of text. Uh, you mentioned portals. Do you know of any? He laughs. Portals? Do I know about portals? He pauses. Well, none personally, except some of the more common ones. Imagine they can be found in practically every ward. Portals are funny things. Sometimes they shift around, at other times they simply seem to vanish. They're hard to keep track of. He shrugs. Alright, I think that's everything. Okay, well, I'm gonna call the episode here, and in the next one, um, we'll see if we can help out uh, Dim Tree the zombie. And uh, what else do we got? Might head into the foundry, so I do this quest and uh, start talking to the godsmen that are there. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope to see y'all in the next episode.